Good morning, dear guests and colleagues. Welcome to uh, Dignity, Danish Institute Against Torture. Uh, welcome to Copenhagen, for those of you who have traveled uh, from abroad, from other parts of, of Denmark. Uh, the topic of today's event is solitary confinement used as a punishment, as a disciplinary sanction. In Dignity, we have deliberately decided uh, to narrow the more wider discussion on solitary confinement to the specific uh, topic of a punishment. And we have done so because uh, the use of solitary confinement as a disciplinary sanction is on the rise uh, in Denmark, uh, in other countries as well. So we find it very timely to focus specifically on this issue. Uh, the conference today has a specific uh, advocacy purpose also. We would like to take uh, the strong, solid recommendations that we hope to get out of today's discussion uh, to Danish politicians, uh, to other stakeholders in the world. And specifically, we have a meeting with uh, the Danish Parliamentary uh, Legal Committee, Folketing uh, is on the 27th of April where we will present uh, the conclusions of today. Uh, we have many speakers on the list today, uh, so I will, uh, without further ado, uh, immediately uh, give the floor to the Director General of Dignity, uh, Dr. Karin Berla. And Karin came to uh, Dignity uh, more than six years ago, in 2011. And I think Karin came with a strong drive from the private sector, from the pharmaceutical industry, and I think that has inspired many of us uh, and has maybe placed uh, dignity better in the more competitive uh, development sector. So, welcome, Karen. Thank you, Emma. And uh, you have just introduced me, so yes, I'm Karen. Uh, and I'm very, very happy to see you all here today. So, a uh, great welcome to all of you. I have reached an age where you have to put glasses on if I look through my notes once in a while here. So excuse me for that. I can't see you now, but I can see the notes. Um, it is a great honor and pleasure for me to open this international conference uh, for the EU or against the use of solitary confinement as a punishment method. This is something we have discussed for quite a while here in Dignity that we wanted to put extra focus or extra emphasis on this on this punishment method, as we wish to call it, or we have uh, chosen to call it. And as Elna just mentioned, we would first of all like to express our very, very deep gratitude that so many of you have taken out time from your very busy schedules. Everybody is busy today, and I know all of you are also busy. And actually, during the weekend, I just wrote a small article about a book that it's now becoming unfashionable to be busy. So uh, let's <laughs> let's join the new era where we will be a bit more relaxed. But we are still very busy. So so today we take time out and maybe reflect a bit, uh, be with us here at Dignity today, and share with us all your experience and all your knowledge and first of all all your ideas. Some of you have traveled from abroad. Uh, abroad uh, you, we have guests here from the US, from the UK, from Finland, Norway, and Poland. And then, of course, we also have a lot of local guests here from Denmark. We are very thankful that you have shown interest in this important topic. Uh, and we are very thankful that you have the willingness to engage, which is maybe more important than just the interest. You have a lot of knowledge, you have a lot of experience, and it's gathered in this room, and we would be very happy to, to sort of facilitate that all this knowledge and experience come to play. I myself am a member, I've been that for three, four years now, of the Danish National Preventive Mechanism. I come there as um, an expert, I must say, today, because uh, Dignity is a house of experts. And what we bring to the Danish NPM is uh, the medical expertise. So it's primarily with that back background we, we join the Danish Ombudsman and we join the Danish Institute of Human Rights that are also present at these meetings. I have been on more or less visiting all <coughs> prisons in Denmark over the few years I've been part of this mechanism. I've also been to the Fairy Islands and I've been to Greenland and tomorrow I'm actually traveling back to Greenland to, 
to, to uh, uh, um, monitor a place of detention there. And during all these visits, I, myself, and all my colleagues have met a lot of people that have been placed in solitary confinement or who is there currently when we are there. And we always pay very special attention to these people we are there because we know they're vulnerable, we, we sort of know what kind of measures that uh, we'll, we'll have to look at and we, when you speak to these people you can also sense just by being with them in the room and listen to their stories that being in a solitary confinement, being alone 22 out of 24 hours a day is a really restraint for, for a human personality. The health consequences of isolation have brought negative impact on the mental health that has been known for quite a while. Uh, and especially, of course, inmates that are not free to leave anyhow. Uh, I recall the Danish research that was uh, effectuated back in the late 90s, where uh, people at that time started to show interest into to the solitary confinement used while the police were investigating crimes. And that was quite common in those days. And uh, at that time, Danish healthcare professionals st started to study and investigate what was actually going on in the minds of these people that were detained uh, as pre-tile detainees. <coughs> and what uh, they, this isolation did uh, to protect, uh, did it really give any added value to the police investigation as was the claim at that time. And these several, there were several healthcare professionals, they documented and they concluded that isolation entailed a risk of damage to the psychosocial well-being of the detainees and that the lack of social contact for them was key reason for their deteriorated health when compared to those that were not in isolation. This evidence then informed, luckily we can say, changes in Danish legislation and in practice and definitely also in the public uh, sphere where people started to debate more and talk about uh, that it was not fair or not okay to leave prisoners all by themselves for, for, for months and months because we did, we did speak month and month at that time. So the situation has now substantially improved. Also when we go and visit the prisons it's very seldom that we meet persons that are isolated because the police are still investigating. So, uh, so we've come that far, and uh, today our ambition is even higher. We want to, to take the next step now and totally abolish uh, that uh, solitary confinement can use as any measure. It would be very encouraging if this conference could be that spark that will lead to a similar change of attitude to the use of isolation that is decided now. It's an administrative decision inside the prisons. That is one of the main reasons why we in Dignity have decided to organize this conference. In Denmark, we actually unfortunately now see that there is a trend in the opposite direction. Spearheaded by at least the two last ministers of justice we have had in this country, the, the current one and the one preceding, coming before him or were here before him, the political push has been very uh, harsh towards more punishment in prisons, and this has, unfortunately, our belief is, lead, led to an increased use and duration of isolation as a punishment method. This applies specifically with respect to unlawful use of mobile phones, that's what we have detected so far, uh, and one could worry that with the smoking prohibition that was put into power uh, on the 1st of April, and it wasn't an April school, it was a true story, that the uh, if people start to smoke within their prison cells, that could also lead to, to a, a similar uh, measure. So um, there are lots of reasons why we should be a bit concerned. To establish a good prison culture with protection of human rights standards is exactly what brings us all together today. And this is something that's very close to the, to the DNA or the heart of dignity. We know from our research, we have researchers that are specifically interested in prison culture, that good prison management is crucial to meet the challenge of re-socializing inmates and preparing them for a uh, good life <coughs> after prison. Our researchers have documented that there is an importance of viewing the prison as a relational environment, an environment where people coexist. It's a shared space where staff and prisoners actually can 
have some kind of relation, a coexistence with each other. And it's therefore our hope that today's discussions will encourage a dialogue between the different perspectives that are in play. Allow me also to mention the positive development in the international legal framework that will be further discussed, uh, I can assure you, later today. Already 25 years ago, the United Nations encouraged the states to work towards the abolition of isolation as a disciplinary measure. In 2015, the Mandela rules were adopted, revising the standard minimum rules for the treatment of prisoners. Now, solitary confinement is, as you all know, defined specifically as 22 out of 24 hours without meaningful contact to other human beings. We also know have a, now have a very clear prohibition of how long that isolation can take place, and that's a, a, a borderline of two weeks. And luckily, there's also some rules uh, against with our rules for which kind of pe persons are in, can be put in, in isolation and who cannot. Children cannot. Women that are pregnant, women that are still breastfeeding, or women that are taking care of smaller infants cannot be put into isolation either. And then, which is very important from a healthcare perspective, persons with mental illness, when it is assumed by a healthcare professional, that such conditions would be worsened if such measures to, took place. And that is, of course, very important that I say here that it has to be a healthcare professional that evaluate the prisoner and that, uh, that put out the word for what can happen to a certain prisoner. Unfortunately, we sometimes see that when we are on prison vi visits that people with mental illnesses are put in, in, in these conditions. So it's important that to, to stress that. In all other cases, isolation, and that's also, again, according to the rules, should only be used exceptionally as a last resort and for as short a time as possible. And then one may ask yourself, at least we do that, how come then that nearly 3,000 uses of the punishment cell in Denmark last year took place? I think that could be uh, maybe a bit over-exaggerated, that that should be considered as exceptional. Um, I just went in to look at the prison statistics this morning and as we speak today around 3,000, a little more than 3,000 people are in confinement in this country in a prison or in a detention. So uh, I know all of them will not be there for a whole year, but uh, you, can sell, you can do the maths yourself that if 3,000 times somebody was used uh, or put, was put in a punishment cell uh, in isolation, that's a rather, rather high figure. So what do experts instead do uh, recommend instead of isolation? I think we will get a lot of good ideas today from, from colleagues from around the world. We know that Sweden and Norway, uh, and we will hear that later today, long ago abolished solitary confinement as a, solitary, uh, as a disciplinary measure. There was reforms put in place in Sweden and they were driven by the recognition of the harms I just mentioned. During the political debate in Sweden, the argument that the measure was indispensable as a last resort was actually totally dismissed. Ultimately, isolation was recognized as raising difficulties for the isolated prisoner in later readjusting back to society, which is important. So the chance that the person can be rehabilitated afterwards is lower if he or she has been in isolation than if they haven't. Detention was considered harmful in itself, I think we all know that, and adding isolation on top of that would, be, would make the resocialization process even more difficult or even harder. So let's be mindful that imprisonment, and we always should remember that, is a punishment in itself. There's no reason to put punishments on top of that. Um, it encourages me to see so many distinguished speakers here today. Also, the stakeholders that are present here really impresses me. There are people here from international human rights bodies. There's from the Kriminalforsorg, which is the prison authorities in Denmark, the Danish Ombudsman, prison directors, representatives of prison staff, very important. There are healthcare professionals here, academia, lawyers, and human rights organizations. 
So let's use this unique opportunity to explore the best ways in which we together will try to solve the problems at hand. As the Director of Dignity, I invite you to share and exchange ideas, experiences and definitely also your perspectives for the future. I hope that we can get strong recommendations out of today, as you just mentioned, Elna, which can inspire the Danish debate, which can inspire the Danish politicians, and ultimately that we can contribute also to a progress worldwide. We are always very visionary and very ambitious in this organization. So let's get rid of this all around the world. In years, I know. It has become common to say that you can actually judge a society on how it treats its prisoners. I know it's also said about other groups, but definitely if we have hard room, as we say in Danish, to treat our prisoners in an okay manner, then we can also judge Denmark as a good country to, to live in. And here we have absolutely something to, to be ambitious towards, uh, just mentioning Norway and Sweden. So this is exactly what I ask you to do, to call for responsibility and respect for the human, uh, for the dignity of our fellow citizens, also the ones that are in prison. I will say thank you from now, and unfortunately, or fortunately, that I don't know how you look at it, I have a monitoring visit today, an unannounced one, uh, so it was a bit secret that I'm leaving now. Um, but I will be back <laughs> uh, later today, I hope, unless we find some serious uh, things in the institution that we are visiting. Uh, I will be back for the, for the closing remarks and for the reception later today. And during, that, uh, during the day, I hope you will come up with some very interesting ideas and some good conclusions that you can bring forward or we can bring forward to the Danish politicians. So thank you and have a good day, all of you. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. Uh, and yes, uh, before we kick off uh, the proceedings, perhaps I may ask panel one to come to the podium. And meanwhile, let me just quickly uh, say about the agenda. You have the agenda, the program uh, in front of you. It's divided into two sections. So before the lunch break, we will look at international aspects. First, uh, the international human rights framework, the normative framework, and afterwards, uh, the uh, health uh, consequences uh, of uh, solitary confinement. And after the lunch break, we will uh, zoom into national practices. Uh, let me also, a few words on practicalities. Uh, the breaks will be held in the library next door. Uh, and we have uh, our librarian with us today, Jon, here standing there at the end of uh, the room. Jon is uh, sitting on a mountain of knowledge and is also hosting the world's largest collection of material about torture, violence, and solitary confinement. So do consider uh, lining up in front of Jon's uh, library, uh, yeah, library and office in the break. Uh, thank you, Jon, and you have also made a lot of material available in the library. Thank you very much. Last comment, uh, in Dignity, we have three musketeers who are sitting over here, or at least one of them is sitting there, Sham, that will be taking minutes uh, from uh, the proceedings. That's all for now. I think we'll kick off with panel two that will be chaired by uh, Therese Rutter, uh, the director of the legal and advocacy department in Dignity. Therese is also the Danish member of CPT, the European Committee on the Prevention of Torture, and has extensive knowledge on prison matters and published widely, let me just mention one, on women in detention that is available in the library. Please, Therese. Thank you very much, Anna, and uh, thank you to everyone. Good morning. It's really a great pleasure to be here and to see so many familiar faces and also new faces. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you to this first panel where, as was mentioned, we will look at the international legal standards governing the use of solitary confinement. What do these standards say? And secondly, we'll be looking at the international human rights treaty bodies that have been established to monitor the treatment, the conditions of persons who are deprived of their liberty, particularly, or also I should say, when they are placed in solitary confinement. Those will be the two key aspects that we'll be addressing during the next hour and 15 minutes. 
Now, we're very privileged, privileged to have three excellent speakers among the three international experts in this area. You can see only two here, but we've got a ghost speaker as well from Glasgow who will appear in a few moments. Now, these three, I would say, leading international experts represent three different international institutions. We've got the United Nations, we've got the Council of Europe, and we've got the OSCE, so bringing together three different perspectives from basically all corners of the world. Now, first of all, I'd like to introduce Sir Malcolm Evans, our first speaker, whom I'd like to warmly welcome, a professor of international law at Bristol University in the UK, and the grand old man in this area, I would say. Um, when I started this area 25 years ago, the first thing I got into my hand was a book by Malcolm Evans. And ever since, you've been residing on my shelf. Malcolm Evans has been, throughout his academic career, researching and publishing extensively on the issue of torture and torture prevention, amongst others in Europe. And moving out from the dusty hallways of your research into the real world, Malcolm became a member of the, uh, Europe, from the um, International UN Committee, Sub uh, Committee on the Prevention of Torture, the SPT, in 2009, and then later in 2011 assumed the role of chair of that body. Now, the UN SPT is the global body that monitors places of detention throughout the world with the aim of preventing torture. And in this capacity, Malcolm has been visiting countless prisons in all corners of the world and has been studying, I would say, um, the use of solitary confinement uh, in practice. I'm also very happy to introduce our second speaker, whom you'll see in a while. We'll keep the suspense. Um, our second speaker is Mr. Jim McManus, who is also a grand old man in the area. He's a member of the European Committee for the Prevention of Torture and a long-standing expert in this field. Um, he, in fact, is our, I should say, expert on solitary confinement issues. Malcolm, um, sorry, Jim McManus has been visiting prisons throughout, I would say, 30 years now. Um, again, as member of the CPT, uh, visiting prisons, visiting other places of detention, and having had first-hand experience interviewing prisoners who are placed in solitary confinement. And in addition to this practical role, uh, Jim McManus was also, until recently, the Professor of Criminal Justice at Glasgow Caledonian University. So he will appear in a moment. And finally, I'm very pleased to also present our colleague, Stephanie Silk, who is a legal uh, advisor, Swiss lawyer, and the OECD's uh, expert on torture prevention issues at the Office of Democratic Institutions and Human Rights in Warsaw. Um, Stephanie Selk has had a career also in torture prevention for a number of years, and inter alia at the United Nations before coming to the OSCE. Um, and there as the assistant of the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, who many of you know, who was actually another pioneer in this field, uh, Dr. Professor Juan Mendes, um, Stephanie was following the process of revising the prison rules. Now we've got the UN standard minimum rules on the treatment of prisoners. They are back from 1955, very old rules, completely out of, uh, out of date. So um, there was a long process in which Stephanie took part, and I would say as one of the architects behind the rules, updating them, bringing them up to date in terms of what is a civilized world today. And specifically, uh, Stephanie has been looking at the issue of solitary confinement and other forms of punishment. So a warm welcome to all of our three speakers. Just before giving you the floor, I'd just like to briefly set the scene. Um, because it's been mentioned before, we will discuss solitary confinement. We've been discussing it as an issue of a disciplinary sanction. And, and what is that? We heard just before that it's now defined as 22 hours where you are locked up in your cell without any meaningful human contact. Now that's the definition. But what does it mean if one has not met one of these persons? Effectively, it means being put in a prison, in the prison. So it's sort of a double punishment, as was mentioned. It means not having any contact, or very little contact, with family members outside. Not having contact with the outside world. Not having contact with fellow prisoners, quite often. And depending on the country, 
very often you would also have a very impoverished regime. No work, no education. The things that are important for prisoners' rehabilitation are basically moved away when a person is placed in solitary confinement as a disciplinary sanction. So these are the conditions <coughs> under which the persons are then placed for two, three, four, sometimes more weeks. Um, and solitary confinement, as was mentioned, has a host of purposes. It may be preventive, it may be protective. Today we'll discuss it as a disciplinary measure. And what are we talking about here? We're talking about prisoners who have committed, not a crime necessarily, but has breached internal prison rules. Now, they can, may have smuggled in mobile phones, so they may have smuggled in drugs, they may have disobeyed orders, or they may have threatened or assaulted fellow uh, prisoners or even prison guards. These are most commonly the reasons why persons are placed in solitary confinement as a sanction. We know, as was mentioned, that this measure has or may have very severe, severe risks to the health, especially the mental health. And this is why the whole use of solitary confinement raises issues in relation to the prohibition of torture and other inhuman or degrading treatment. This is why we're bringing it up here at Dignity, where, it's, where um, the prohibition of torture is really something that is at the car core of our work. And I would say not only does solitary confinement set the scene for the deliberate infliction of harm, shielded from other prisoners, but it may also in itself amount to inhuman or degrading treatment. So this is just setting the scene, talking about what, what is it really that is at stake today. So very now, I'm very happy to pass on the word. Basically, as you can see from the program, we have a number of questions listed. The three key issues that we'll be discussing now is what do the international standards say about solitary confinement? Secondly, how is solitary confinement as a sanction viewed by the international monitoring bodies, that is the SPT and the CPT? And finally, I'd like to ask the question, what are the global and European trends that we see in this punitive measure? Are we moving towards an increase, or do we also see a move in the direction of abolition? So I think without further ado, uh, I would like to pass the floor now to uh, Sir Malcolm Evans, who will be speaking about the evolving international legal framework governing the use of solitary confinement as a <coughs> disciplinary sanction, and also giving us an insight into the jurisprudence of the SPT. Thank you. Thank you. And should I say, do you want me to speak from here or up there? As you like. Um, I'll go from up there. <laughs> Thank you. There are two reasons I'd rather do it from up here. The first is, if I'm standing up, inevitably I will ultimately want to sit down. <laughs> the second is that I see Teresa's got a card with a number on it for the amount of time I have left. And if I'm standing over here, as Karen said, one of the advantages of age is that you cannot read what's on paper. <laughs> um, and so I, I, I um, both immune myself from one um, um, mechanism, but make myself susceptible to another. Um, First of all, let me thank the organisers very much for inviting me to speak at this very important um, e event today. Uh, as I enter what I'm going to say, I am slightly conscious that a number of the things may appear at first sight to run contrary to what the um, to what the focus of this event actually is, but on reflection, I hope you will see that that is absolutely not the case. As Therese mentioned, what um, the plan is and what I hope to do is to spend a little time with you this morning saying something of what we as the SPT consider to be the international standards uh, surrounding the use of solitary confinement as a disciplinary measure and to say something about our practical experience of solitary confinement. And I would like to say that the two of them work closely hand in hand with each with each other, but I'm afraid to say in some senses there is a little bit of a tension between the two. In other words, where the standards that we set are based on a certain set of assumptions about the way in which solitary confinement and indeed uh, custody is actually experienced 
whereas the realities of some of, um, of where the realities that we face are often looking really rather different, very different to that, and that then leads us as an international committee into having to think hard about how we, shall we say, approach um, a question such as solitary confinement in the contexts in which we find it. So in a sense, what I want to do is spend a little while just setting out what the basics of our approach is, and they say something about the perplexing contexts in which we see it taking place. I should also say that when I, it comes to saying what the SBT has to say about things, as many in this room will know, we run into a problem. And that is that the work of the SBT, according to the international instrument, the optional protocol under which we operate, is confidential. Um, which always produces a little bit of a problem about saying what we say, think. So, I'm sitting down now, no. Um, we have in fact conducted a little over 50 visits um, uh, now as the SPT, and happily over 20 of those visit reports have been published, and therefore what is said in those reports is in the public um, domain. And many of these do chronicle and comment on the use of solitary confinement as a disciplinary measure. And so my intention was to use this address to set out exactly what we have said about this, uh, because we've not really done so in any other former, uh, format as a committee. But as I mentioned, when I was reviewing the experience, as reflected in our published reports, and I stress that, it did become clear to me that this would be, for the reasons that I gave, somewhat more difficult than I'd anticipated. This is partly a methodological thing that I don't want to waste too much time on. For a variety of reasons, the SPT has not gone down the path of generating formal-looking statements and sets of standards as such and in its reports tends to focus on the application of approaches in the contexts which it seems, sees. And so that does tend to mean that what we say in our reports, rather than abstract pronouncements, <coughs> tends to be linked to particular contexts. And as I mentioned, this does yield some surprises, which I'll, um, uh, which I'll share with you in, in, in some moments. But do let me be quite clear about our understanding of the international normative framework. Much of what we consider it to be has already been outlined already in what Karen and what Therese has already said and is also outlined in the excellent background paper that has been prepared for this meeting. We fully endorse the views on this which are set out in the Nelson Mandela rules and we do consider that these reflect a minimum standard and, and this is an odd area to talk about minimums because it can be confusing. By a minimum standard, in this instance, we mean a maximist approach. This is, beyond, this is something beyond which one cannot go. And we must be careful in the use of minimum maximum uh, in this particular context. We clearly endorse, and indeed have endorsed in published reports some years ago, the, let us say, the 22 out of 24 hour approach. That is, uh, that, that is clear. We also, in our reports, have endorsed the view that there must be meaningful, um, that meet about meaningful contact time within those periods. Um, we have never defined precisely what meaningful contact actually means, but I'm absolutely confident that it will be fully reflective of what we find in the Essex position paper, which is referred to um, in, the, in the background document. We have also said that solitary confinement for disciplinary purposes should not be um, applied for, for minors. We have endorsed this. I cannot find a direct reference to it re referring to pregnant women, but I have got absolutely no doubt that should we run into such a situation, that is what we would say. We have also made it clear that we do not believe that solitary confinement as a disciplinary sanction should ever be applied to persons with mental disabilities. We have not added, to the best of my knowledge, the rider that was given, which, which Karen mentioned in her opening presentation, concerning the need for that to be assessed by a healthcare professional. Why? 
frankly, because it would be very difficult in many of the contexts in which we are working to require that simply because, regretfully, there aren't any. And so if we were to introduce that as a positive caveat, it would actually open the door for, more broad, for, for, for broader use rather than close it. And so we, we have not mentioned that, that that is something that possibly we could, could think about. Um, but uh, as I say, it's not something that figures in what we have said. I will admit, I cannot find in any of our published reports a direct reference to the ma a maximum of 15 days. But for the avoidance of doubt, we do. And I do mention at this point, elliptically, I did say I cannot find in a published report um, that we endorse the 15-day day position. And finally, as you might expect, in our reports we have said a good deal about processes, that it should be as a last resort, that there should be due process leading up to the imposition of um, solitary confinement as a sanction, that it should be subject to forms of review uh, during its course, um, as regards its effect on the person concerned and that the application of it as a sanction should be subject to a form of appeal and review in and of itself. In one sense, none of this ought to be very surprising because it is now, in my view, firmly embedded in international standards that this ought to be the case. But I ought to go one step further and remind us all that the SPT, and yes, many in this room who are members of national preventive mechanisms, inhabit the world of prevention. And it is therefore appropriate that we should not only think in terms of what accords with standards, but also what prevents risks. And solitary confinement, as I'm sure we will see across the course of the day, enhances greatly the risks of inhuman and degrading treatment being visited upon persons. And so, even this minimum or maximum should be viewed with constant scepticism if one is approaching it from a preventive position. And a, pre a preventive approach would seek to mitigate the potential effects by further reduction in length and greater focus on the applicable regime for those who are held in a form of disciplinary sanction. So that is, I would say, what the orthodoxy is as regards standards and a word to those involved in prevention that prevention is not about ensuring compliance with those standards but to ensure that those at risk of ill treatment uh, are not subjected to ill treatment, which argues for an ever decreasing use of solitary confinement as a disciplinary sanction. But what is the experience into which we must contextualise this? The headline, it seems to me, is that the SVT's experience shows that Whilst all this is absolutely the case, it is also necessary, if one is going to tackle the phenomena in practice, to also understand the overall context of the particular prison or other detention facilities and of the, of the detention systems concerned, if one is going to be able to effectively address the use and therefore the effects of solitary confinement. There is a tendency, which I entirely understand and to which I'm prone, to want to focus on the legal framework surrounding its use and believe that, that, will affect, and that better regulation will eliminate or mitigate its use. And of course that is one of the things that the conference is going to be focusing on across the course of today. What I want to stress is that this purely normative approach is regretfully unlikely to be sufficient and that the problems can only be effectively tackled when the reality of the detention context is properly taken into account as well. And in particular, the boundary between solitary confinement as a punishment, as a sanction, and as a generalised practice is often <coughs> blurred in many detention situations to the point of disappearance. And indeed, the regime conditions associated with the punitive dimensions of solitary <coughs> confinement are often imposed on detainees for non-disciplinary reasons. And the regime dimensions <coughs> of punitive solitary confinement are not always experienced in circumstances, indeed, of isolation. 
in short, the boundaries between all aspects to do with solitary confinement as a disciplinary regime are often blurred. And thus an overly normative or regulatory approach can fail to capture the essence of the problem, which I would perhaps term as being concerning the regimes of solitary confinement. I'm aware that all I'm really saying is that the detention <coughs> systems we encounter are often so dysfunctional that the articulation and adoption of proper systems and safeguards will fail to deliver the intended outcomes. And I suspect that this is no surprise to anyone, disappoint us all as it will. But it may also mean that in approaching the problems of solitary confinement, we do need to focus on the multiple situations in which it arises if we are going to be able to deal with it appropriately. And certainly, disciplinary sanction is an excellent and an appropriate place to start. The other problems, however, will need to be addressed in time. I will briefly move towards a close by just giving some examples of the practical experiences as found in our reports. I would say that perhaps paradoxically, it was in one of our earliest reports that we set out the essence of what might be a more formalised approach with the greatest, greatest clarity, and this was in our published report to Benin. We said, and I quote, the SBT recommends that all disciplinary procedures be authorised and implemented by the prison administration through duly established and recorded disciplinary procedures about which all detainees should be informed. Disciplinary isolation should not be used for minors, adolescents, nor for mentally ill detainees. Those detainees placed in disciplinary cells retain the same rights to access health care and may require extra vigilance from all staff as to their state of health. The SBT also recommends, in the specific context of the prisons visited, that when detainees are placed in a disciplinary cell for more than 12 hours, they should be given access to the, to the outdoors for one hour um, each day, and the healthcare staff of the prison should perform daily checks on their health in the disciplinary cell, it being understood that the doctor should act, as always, in the best interests of the health of the prisoner. And that was in a report, I think, that was drafted back in about 2009, so quite a long time ago now. In our subsequent report on Paraguay, published report, the SPT said, quote, prolonged solitary confinement may amount to an act of torture or other cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment and recommends the state party should severely restrict the use of solitary confinement as punishment for persons deprived of their liberty. It should not be used in the case of minors or the mentally ill. <coughs> Therefore, in those two early comments, we do see the basics of the approach which I outlined a few moments ago, suggesting that whilst the use of solitary confinement for disciplinary purposes is not per se wrongful, its use in the context of minors and, and persons with mental disabilities is, the, um, the application of sanctions should be the result of a proper process, regular exercise be permitted, health checks provided. The trouble is, as our reports demonstrate, much of this is widely, wildly aspirational. In the context of Paraguay, we even suggested that the reality might amount to torture. How does that map on? Well, let's describe the situation from the report. The solitary <coughs> confinement cells at the National Prison were in a bad state. There were three cells approximately two and a half metres by two and a half metres square, one of which had up to five prisoners crammed into it. None of the bathrooms were working properly and two of them leaked incessantly. The prisoners said there were rats in them. The stench with the poor ventilation and heat made it difficult to breathe. The SBT interviewed 11 the 11 prisoners who were being held in solitary confinement on various grounds, including clashes with other prisoners, disobeying the orders of prison staff, attempted escape, possession of knives or drugs. One of the prisoners had been in solitary confinement for almost three months, although the regulations prescribed a maximum period of 30 days. 
All the prisoners interviewed confirmed that prison staff demanded payment of a large sum of money as a condition for leaving the solitary confinement wing. No, first of all, is this solitary confinement? At one level, clearly not. Five persons in a single cell is not exactly solitary. <laughs> but the regime under which they were being held was, in principle, that of solitary confinement, and the cells involved were intended for such purposes. And note also that it is highly likely that the real use for the prolonged use of confinement became less of a disciplinary sanction, even if it had started off as such, but had become a means of financial, extor um, uh, f financial extortion. This is quite <coughs> common. Turning to other SBT experiences, we can see <coughs> that the uses are again blurred. We often find a ca coming to situations where it is really used for prison management. Thus, in Argentina, the SPT found in several units, inmates are assigned to segregated areas not as a form of punishment, but for other reasons, such as when they arrive in prison or relocated as a preventive measure, protective measure, where they may be for several weeks or even months in isolation. And the regime, of course, will be a punishment regime during that time without the appropriate safeguards. Naturally, we say that that is not what it ought to be. But there is an alarming tendency to use the regime of solitary confinement as a means of protecting vulnerable prisoners. This is, of course, not only completely unacceptable, um, but it is the reality in many systems, that places that we find, when it is necessary to take prisoners out of a multiple occupancy situation for reasons of their own safety, the only practical alternative is to put them into a solitary confinement um, situation where the regime is in fact punitive and there is no effort made to moderate the one against the other. The final point I would wish to make, I did see the sign, um, I couldn't read it but I saw it, um, <laughs> The final point I want to make, which for some may be the most shocking, is who is responsible for solitary confinement? Of course, the state is legally responsible, but what happens in practice? A quote from our published report on Mali, where we found protracted solitary confinement is also used as a means of punishing prisoners, including by cell and yard bosses, i.e. other prisoners themselves. Another very common form of punishment is to chain prisoners by feet and hands in solitary confinement. These forms of torture and ill-treatment can last several weeks, even months, and is undertaken in a completely arbitrary manner, undocumented, with no registration, which allows the perpetrators to act with complete impunity and thus arbitrary use of, and exacerbates arbitrary use of power. Note, this is prisoners imposing solitary confinement on other prisoners for internal relational issues. Now that speaks to a high degree of something profoundly wrong within a prison system. I think we know that. But it is also symptomatic of the, of the, of the range of experiences <clears throat> that those who are suffering solitary confinement have. And indeed, we have met many <coughs> detainees who, who crave the security of solitary confinement and undertake disciplinary offences in the hope of being taken out of the situation in which they currently find themselves in order to be placed in solitary confinement because they may consider it to be a safer space to be. This is not to speak in praise of solitary confinement it is to just remind ourselves that when we look across the course of the day at the enormous negative effect that solitary confinement can have on people, the effect of the broader situation within many prisons in which people are held around the world is at least as, if not as, wor worse again. And so it just reminds us that this is not a niche problem in an otherwise excellent system but merely a symptom of the problems and the profound problems that are faced by so many who are placed in detention in detention facilities around the world. We need to understand the effects of solitary confinement on detainees. We also need to acknowledge the appalling range of factors which affect its use and its effects and thus construct our normative frameworks and our preventive safeguards accordingly. Thanks very much.
very much to you, Melvin, for this intriguing insight into how solitary confinement is used across the world and what is the experience of the SPT. If I may just extract a couple of points that you've made, um, which I think might feed into the further discussion, one of them being that solitary confinement plays out very differently in very different places in this world. You've made the point very clear. I think it's important to keep in mind, but also to keep the point in mind that even in the most well-functioning uh, criminal justice systems, where conditions are good, solitary confinement may still be very damaging. So, so let's keep that in mind as the first point. Secondly, I like your quote that solitary confinement should be viewed with constant skepticism. Again, solitary confinement has different forms, different purposes, but the punitive purpose is the one which one could say is the least necessary. Look, let's look at skepticism upon that. And then finally, um, <coughs> being a legal panel here, I think it's daring and also very important that you say, well, the legal regulation is pretty much the first step the legal regulation will not change the practices. What is important is to look at the practices on the ground, how these factor in. So I think these three comments are just a scratches in the surface, but some of them that you made, that which I hope we can um, look further on in this panel. <coughs> now, moving on to our next speaker, um, who is with us from Glasgow. I'm very pleased to I would say go from this world tour of prisons in Mali and in Benin to zoom in on the European context and now to give the floor to my fellow colleague Jim McManus, um, as I mentioned before, of the European Committee for the Prevention of Torture and he'll be speaking about the experience and the standards of the CPT as regards solitary confinement as a disciplinary measure. And please, uh, Jim, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tres, for that kind introduction. You called me a grand old man, and I manifested at least the old part of that last night in Edinburgh Airport when I lost my passport, and therefore I'm not with you in person. I do apologise for that, and I apologise first to, to the organisers for the great effort they've made, but I also apologise to myself, because I realise I'm missing a very exciting day of good interaction. And in particular, I want to say hello to my old friend, Ben Sorensen, who I gather is with you. I was looking forward to renewing an acquaintance started 25 years ago, and the learning I experienced from that man that has stood me in good stead all my life. So I'm sorry I'm not with you in person. I'll do my best to make up for it by these electronic mechanisms. I also want to say thank you to the organisers for the excellent briefing papers that have been distributed to everyone taking part in the conference. When I read those on Friday, I thought, gosh, why are we having a conference at all? This says it all. An excellent summary of what's been done in this field, a bibliography which would take anyone months to get through, and a comprehensive approach to the whole difficult question of solitary confinement. Now, I'm asked to talk about the CPT's approach to solitary confinement. The CPT has some advantages over SPT, the main advantage I think being age. We are 15 years older than, than SPT, but we've also been able, over these years, to take a thematic approach to things within custodial um, situations. And one of the topics we addressed back in 2011 was the use of solitary confinement. And in our general report for that year, we, we cover, we, we outline the CPT's in-depth thinking about all forms of solitary confinement. Reflecting on that now, and I, I chaired the subgroup that drafted the report, but reflecting on it now, I think it was a mistake to try to cover all forms of solitary confinement in the one paper. And that's why I'm particularly glad that the focus today is on one aspect of solitary confinement, that of disciplinary solitary confinement, because it enables us to tease out what's actually going on in the specific example of punitive solitary confinement. Way back in the old days, the so-called good old days, we shockingly, perhaps sadistically, overtly punished the bodies of prisoners who committed disciplinary offences. We put them on bread and water diets. We put them on the treadmill. We flogged them. We, we continued flogging them in the UK 
right up until the European Court of Human Rights told us, that's not very nice. We eventually to stop it. We clapped people in irons. We subjected them to hard labor. Now, thank goodness, physical punishments of that kind, physical punishments in the body, have been rejected, at least by all right-thinking nations, and in conformity with Article 3 of the European Convention. But our understanding of solitary confinement has been very slow to develop. It's been a long time taken in realising the very harmful psychological and physiological effects of solitary confinement. On its own, or combined with deprivation of contact with the outside world, visits, telephones, newspapers, television, we hadn't recognised until very, very recently the profound effects of this punishment on people. Indeed, it wasn't mentioned at all in the original United Nations standard minimum rules for the treatment of prisoners. But the idea has caught hold very quickly, not just in the 2011 report of the CPT, but also now in the Nelson Mandela rules, which clearly address the whole issue of corporal punishment. Sorry, the whole issue of solitary confinement. So, for example, they suggest that courts should never impose this as a punishment on its own. This still happens in many countries. Sometimes it happens on remand because the courts want people to be held apart from other prisoners for, they say, the purposes of justice. And it still happens as part of a sentence in some parts of the world where the courts want to aggravate the already severe punishment, deprivation of liberty. So they've gone for a total prohibition of courts imposing it, and the Nelson Mandela rules have also gone for a total prohibition on the use of solitary confinement for juveniles, a situation, a position that the CPT had reached earlier. When we sat down to write the 2011 annual report, we, of course, involved representatives of all 47 member states of the Council of Europe. And meeting in such a group requires compromise. As a chair of that group, it involved me in particular compromise when it came to discussing solitary confinement as a disciplinary punishment. Because I come from Scotland. That's why we need passports to get to places like uh, Copenhagen. <laughs> I hope that not always be the case. <laughs> but it came to, to that, I came from Scotland, and that meant I came from a discipline in which solitary confinement as a disciplinary punishment has always been restricted to a maximum of three days. We went round the room with other member states saying, what was your maximum in your country? And to show how culturally this is not a, a unique phenomenon. In the nearest member state to Scotland, that is Ireland, we found that the maximum period of solitary confinement as a disciplinary punishment was 56 days. Three days on one side of the Irish Sea, 56 days on the other side of the Irish Sea. An incredible period. Incidentally, I, I've worked in Ireland quite a lot and I spent a lot of time in the unit where they served this 56 days. And I was there three summers in a trot. And in three summers in the trot, the same man was present serving his 56 days of solitary confinement. And of course, we find this everywhere. They talk about solitary confinement as a, a, a deterrent. In fact, if you look at the prison records in any country, you find the same names appearing time and time again in solitary confinement. It's a disciplinary picture. It may deter other people, but it certainly doesn't seem to deter many of the people who end up serving the sentence. But I spoke to this man at some length, and he told me that he comes down to Cork, in those days he came down to Cork, every year for his summer holidays. He intentionally committed, as Malcolm mentioned earlier on, he intentionally committed offences in order to get a break from the prison in which he served the rest of his sentence. And one of his motivations, he told me, 
was to give his mum a break from coming to visit him every week. Because she came in every week and she said, well, what's happening this week, son? And his answer was, actually, mum, the same as last week, and the same as the week before, and the same as what happened for the next 20 years. Absolutely nothing. So he gave his mum a break from the visit. He gave him a break from the prison he was in. <clears throat> and it also allowed him, I was told by staff, it allowed him to clear the debts that he accumulated in his main prison during the rest of the year. But nonetheless, he spent 56 days every year without any contact <coughs> with the outside world, without any contact with other prisoners. It's a complex phenomenon. But reaching a consensus among the group in the CPT was incredibly difficult. Many people said, what else can we do to punish people apart from put them in solitary confinement? Now we know there is a wide range of things that can be done in a prison setting to punish people. We know in Scotland that the most effective punishment for prisoners is deprivation of television. That's a much more effective punishment in solitary confinement, and of course, it has much less effect on the person, although it works in practical deterrence. But looking back on that report too, I also think that we didn't go nearly far enough in our approach to solitary confinement as a punishment. The abandonment of physical punishment mm -hmm. took a long time in history, two centuries worth of it in Scotland, we should not spend the same length of time in moving to abolish solitary confinement as a punishment. The intentional infliction of living conditions, which we now fully know to have a profoundly deleterious effect on the health of those subject to them. If solitary confinement doesn't qualify as cruel and inhuman punishment, Article 3 of the European Convention letting us down. We should be moving <coughs> out I do to abolish corporal uh, solitary confinement as a punishment for all classes of prisoners. That it is purely a punishment is evidenced by the practice in many of our member states in the Council of Europe of imposing solitary confinement sometime after the alleged disciplinary offence which occasions it, sometimes well after, months <coughs> after because of the practice of accumulating disciplinary offences before carrying out an adjudication. Doing that removal weeks or months after the alleged offence shows us that the motivation is punitive. And given the potential and actual consequences of solitary confinement, this is simply not acceptable. It does not meet the test of necessity, which requires to be passed before the conscious infliction of punishment can be seen as legitimate. There is a case, a very strong case, I think, for maintaining solitary confinement in particular circumstances, but not as a punishment. We can use solitary confinement as a preventative mechanism. We can use it as an administrative mechanism, subject to the kind of protections that the European Court of Human Rights has been very clear defining that Malcolm has already referred to and it need to be enforced in order to render the, the practice legitimate but only legitimate again as Malcolm has said simply complying with the rule, the, the rule natural justice in enforcing this practice doesn't make it acceptable it may, may render it legitimate but not acceptable we have to be clear why we're doing that in terms of prevention, in terms of protection, but if we're compounding it by confusing, or confusing it with using uh, solitary confinement also as a punishment, then we are going to confuse our understanding of a very, very important and effective method of ensuring protection and good order in prisons. That's why I think the CPT now should revisit the whole question of solitary confinement as a disciplinary punishment. We should go back to it and say, how can we justify the conscious infliction of psychological and physiological punishment on people 
in response to disciplinary infractions within a prison. How can we possibly do that? We manage to get away from all these intentional physical uh, inflictions of pain, and we're now stuck with one which we know, and which the research of many people in the room with you today has shown is a very, very serious infliction of effective corporal and psychological punishment. This time we faced that head on. This time we moved towards not the kind of general statement that CPT has made in, for example, uh, the recent report on the visit to Spain, where we said, our maximum incidentally is 14 days, where we said 14 day maximum, but we encourage you also to go beyond that and, and to restrict it even further than the 14 days. I think we have to bite the bullet now and say, abolish the use of corporal punishment. Uh, abolish use of solitary confinement as a punishment for disciplinary offences. Restrict its use to those necessary administrative um, occasions on which the protection of a prisoner demands it, or the protection of other prisoners from dangerous prisoners demands it. So my stand now would be a total abolition of the, the intentional infliction of pain on people as a disciplinary punishment. And I'm sure read the briefing paper for your day today. That's a way that your conference will move today. And I trust it comes out a strong public statement to that effect. And also that it takes steps to disseminate the briefing paper that has been produced for today, plus anything else that's added to it by the excellent people for attending your day. I wish you a thoroughly enjoyable day. I wish you a profitable day. And I look forward to positive consequences from the discussions you have today. Jim McManus is in his presentation here. I think two key points that I would like to draw out that I think needs to be kept in the back of our minds throughout the day is the uh, comparison between physical punishment and psychological punishment. We all agree that physical punishment is no longer accepted and it has for long not been accepted. It's been outlawed. We still accept psychological punishment. Now, what's the difference? And we even know, I would say, that psychological punishment has severe, may have severe physical consequences. So let's keep that point at the back of our minds. As uh, Jim McManus was saying when we met with the European Court of Human Rights recently, solitary confinement as a disciplinary sanction has no place in a civilized world. That was a quote he said to the European judges only a few weeks ago. And so the abolition here is something that he's advocating for only five years after that we as the CPT, he as the CPT, has said, well, yes, it may be used under certain circumstances. I think Malcolm's point also shows that even these international monitoring bodies have an evolution in their practice and have now obviously reached a stage where they are increasingly aligning with the Mandela rules and understanding the need to abolish this measure. Um, and I think another point, the alternatives the same purpose can be reached by much less intrusive means. As we all know, all of us are on our mobiles. We watch television. Remove that, that's going to make us suffer even more, and it's not going to give any uh, lasting health consequences. So these two points are basically made. Now I'd like to give the floor to our final speaker, Ms. Stephanie Selk, who will uh, basically complement two previous speakers who have been speaking about the practice of the international monitoring bodies and now we will zoom into the new rules, the new Nelson Mandela rules that were adopted only a year and a half ago. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Therese. Um, I would like to start by thanking the organizers for having me here. 
and also echoing the compliment with regard to the background uh, material that we have been receiving, which proves the in-depth in research of dignity um, um, into the subject. Um, I do have a PowerPoint presentation, <laughs> so we're waiting for it, okay. I also want to mention, as I did to Malcolm this morning, I'm a bit nervous, so bear with me. It's not that I'm not used to talk to people, that's not the problem, but being on the same panel with experts like um, of the caliber of Malcolm and Mr. McManus uh, still makes me nervous, so bear with me, please. <laughs> ah, so this is the video. Um, yes, so the... Um, as the advisor on torture prevention of the OSCE uh, ODIR office, um, I'm closely working uh, together with Panel Reform International on the implementation of the new rules. And usually before I present um, the content of the new rules, I show this uh, very brief video to give you an idea of uh, the revision process of the rules as such. So it's a two minutes video, short and concise, so please go ahead. for the treatment of prisoners, which were first adopted back in 1955, have remained unchanged for 60 years, until now. In 2011, governments agreed to review these rules to bring them into line with modern criminal justice and human rights standards. Four years later, with the revisions complete, the updated rules were adopted unanimously by the United Nations as the Nelson Mandela Rules. These new rules will not only protect the rights of prisoners, but also provide solid guidance for prison staff. Not all the rules are updated, but there is new guidance across eight areas of prison standards. Here are three examples. Managing prisoners' files is key to running a professional prison. The Mandela rules state that a prisoner's information must be kept, not just on arrival, but comprehensively and safely throughout their entire time in prison. Body searches are a humiliating experience for prisoners. The Mandela rules state that such searches must only be carried out if absolutely necessary and must not harass or intimidate. Intrusive searches must only be performed by staff of the same sex in private and records must be kept. Solitary confinement can severely damage prisoners' mental health, their chances of rehabilitation, and it doesn't make prisons easier to manage. The new rules state that isolation should only be used as a last resort, and for as short a time as possible. Some new rules will require time and resources to implement. Others can be put into practice without significant cost. Good governance, training and a culture of respect for human rights will all go a long way. Get started by visiting www.penalreform.org. So uh, one of the major success, I think, in, in, in my view, but also um, uh, many other experts and civil society organizations, is that the prohibition against torture and ill treatment has now uh, specifically been introduced to the rules. Um, we have um, rule number one of the, of the Nelson Mandela rules now states first that the treatment of prisoners uh, sh um, should be treated um, with respect for their dignity and value as a human being, but then also in the second part of the same rule we have the prohibition of torture and cruel and human degrading treatment or punishment specifically mentioned. And then this prohibition has been mainstreamed throughout the entire uh, process uh, of revision and now in the rules we find numerous um, um, provisions that relate to the prohibition against torture, which I think is, uh, is obviously very relevant to, the, to what we are going to discuss about solitary confinement right now. Um, I'm going to mention some of those at the end if there is still time, but one, one I want to mention here is Rule uh, 34, for instance, uh, which says that if healthcare professionals become aware um, of signs of ill treatment or torture during an exam uh, examination um, of uh, inmates, they shall report to the competent medical, judicial or, the, or administrative authority, which obviously plays a role also when it comes um, to solitary <coughs> confinement. But I'll come back to that um, later on. 
So now going uh, straight into um, the, the provisions on solitary confinement in those revised rules, and also I wanted to have uh, make a side uh, remark, I usually go into the re revision process first, giving an idea why those rules have been revised, but considering the time, I move this part back, so if there is time left, we can still come back to that. So with regard to solitary confinement, um, <coughs> so first there are some general uh, provisions, overarching principles, I, I would call them, uh, with regard to disciplinary measures as such, where solitary confinement then after in the rules, um, there are a couple of rules specifically designed um, on solitary confinement, but those overarching principles um, apply as well. So we have, uh, for instance, discipline and order with, should not um, be um, imposed with more restriction than necessary. We have um, that... <coughs> prison administration shall use to the extent possible conflict prevention, mediation or, or uh, alternative dispute resolution mechanisms to prevent disciplinary offences or to resolve conflicts. So and this is a reference to what we call dynamic security which is then also mentioned um, with regard to the training of penitentiary staff later on in the rules and this idea of dynamic security now is also contained in the rules mainstream throughout the document. And then we have a principle which is more related to separation. Um, for prisoners who are or have been separated, measures should be in place to alleviate detrimental effects of separation. We have also now very strongly the, um, le the necessity for um, legal basis for uh, disciplinary measures. And then we have in Rule 37D, as this very same um, requirement particularly for solitary confinement. Now this rule reads, any form of involuntary separation um, from the general prison population requires authorization by law or regulation. And then the rule says, such as solitary confinement, isolation, segregation, special care units or restricting housing, whether as disciplinary sanction or for maintenance of order and security. Um, I would like to stop quickly here with this rule and give you a, a bit of an insight um, with regard to the negotiations on the revision of the Mandela rules. This very innocently looking um, provision almost brought down the entire revision process. It was introduced on the last day of the last negotiations in Cape Town around midnight by one uh, government, which I'm not going to name, but if you look at the um, name given to uh, separation, you may guess which country this was. And it was strongly opposed by some other governments um, until four o'clock in the morning. There was no agreement and it would have meant that the entire revision process would not go through. The chair of the negotiations, um, a South African Supreme Court judge, left already the meeting and handed over the chair of the meeting to the Uruguayan delegation, which tried to, to get a compromise on this uh, provision. Now, I just want to say that after you will see the definition um, of solitary confinement and the later provisions, always take solitary confinement as the overarching term. Um, but in this provision here, for the legal basis, it's called involuntary separation, and then it names such as solitary confinement. So what does that mean? Does that give a loophole or not for certain countries? That's the question, and that's where we have to step in and give a legal interpretation which actually does not allow for any loopholes. I ju just, um, I find that very intriguing. <laughs> I don't know for you, but um, just to look um, so much into detail. And then the second uh, point here, uh, it says involuntary separation, so what we already heard by the other speakers, so what about voluntary separation? Um, we are not going to t discuss that today, but um, so it means that this is excluded um, from this uh, requirement or not. And this is the other thing I wanted to mention. And the third one is the last sentence, which is rather positive, because this uh, rule is uh, 37, is under disciplinary measures um, in the Nelson Mandela rules, but the last sentence, the last part of the sentence uh, says that or for maintenance of order and security, which um, um, 
which gives the opportunity to make an interpretation that also administrative uh, solitary confinement is is covered here so we try to sneak that in and it happened so we we actually do have here the opportunity to apply all the following rules uh, on administrative um, segregation as well so to give you an insight on how much into detail and how um, difficult it was also to come up with a compromise for the Nelson Mandela's and they are by no means perfect um, and that's one of the reasons, because it was a compromise, but still, I think, a huge progress into what we had before. Um, <clears throat> then we have uh, Rule 39, which says that um, sanction uh, should always be in accordance with the law, principle of fairness and due process, and a prisoner shall never be sanctioned twice for the same offence. Um, there, um, there should always be a proportionality between the disciplinary punishment and the offence and there should be proper record keeping which is a very important I would say safeguard <coughs> also um, and which would allow for monitoring uh, bodies to look into the use of solitary confinement more precisely and then very important um, prison administration officials should consider whether mental illness or develop, develop mental disability have contributed to the conduct and they should not sanction conduct that is a direct result of such illness or disability. Now here we will hear hopefully later today, it also raises questions uh, with regard for instance the involvement of medical staff um, in the prison settings. Um, you will see, I will come to it later, there is a clear rule that medical staff should not be involved in the imposition of disciplinary sanctions. So what does that mean exactly for the prison doctor? Um, so, But I, I also hope to get some answers this afternoon because it's a difficult question. Um, then we have Rule 41 um, that says that um, in the context of disciplinary sanctions there is a right to defence and uh, there should be the opportunity uh, for the inmate to seek judicial review of the sanction and the more severe the sanction is, the more this uh, should um, um, take place. Then we come uh, to a very um, important rule and we approach now the definition of solitary confinement in the rules, uh, which also you, you see that the, the, maybe the order of the rules does not always make sense, but I decided to go rule by rule. Um, 43.1 uh, is important because it states, in no circumstances may restriction or disciplinary sanctions amount to torture or other cruel inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. I will come back to this um, provision later on. Um, in, per in particularly prohibited are indefinite solitary confinement and prolonged solitary confinement. So there is no question about this anymore and I think we can say this is a, this is a huge major step forward now um, contained in those uh, UN minimum standard rules. And I'll come to what is prolonged uh, just in a minute. And then uh, the same provision uh, says also that disciplinary sanctions shall not include uh, the prohibition of family contact. Now, what is solitary confinement? We heard it already today um, several times. Um, maybe to give you a bit more of a history how, how we came up with this definition during the revision process, which says actually that the confinement of prisoners for 22 hours or more a day without meaningful human contact. And in the same uh, provision it also says that pro, uh, prolonged means um, 15 consecutive um, days. So the three minutes, wow. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll go quickly. Um, well, I'll give you the explanation why this definition may be uh, throughout the day, but it's based on, on the UN Special Rapporteur's first report on solitary confinement in 2011, where he already took into consideration the entire body of literature. We have one uh, expert here, Sharon Jalef, um, today who may give more explanation also on this. And with this, I'm going now to the interpretation which has been done with regard to what means meaningful human contact, because that's not a legal term. And how can you, you cannot go to a prison and tell uh, prison uh, staff and administration that um, they should allow for meaningful human contact if uh, uh, they will just simply tell you, and that's what I heard a lot, that there is delivery of food three times a day and that the inmate is uh, free 
to talk to the to the, the delivery service, or that he can actually shout through through the wall to the other prisoners, so they can actually have a conversation together. So um, we have to encounter this, and um, the Essex um, expert group, which is a group of experts consisting of international bodies, but independent experts and NGOs who has been involved in the re revision process throughout the four years, um, now came up with a definition, um, which I just want to point out the most important one. So the meaningful human contact has to be face-to-face -face and direct, and more than fleeting or incidental, enabling empathetic and interpersonal communication. And it, it should not be limited to prison routines. Um, <coughs> Sir Nigel Rodley, who is unfortunately no longer with us, um, Sharon Shalef was involved in, in, in the deliberation of this um, definition, Juan Mendes as well, so maybe we can go more into detail, but this is how we understand the Nelson Mandela rules definition of solitary confinement now. Um, just a brief word, why 15 days for prolonged solitary confinement? Well, the idea was um, that the literature showed that some of the adverse health um, ish, um, implications that solitary confinement has from the beginning, and for some people from the first minute they <laughs> arrive there, um, become irre irreversible after 15 days. So that's why the special rapporteur uh, on torture in 2011 draw the line there. He acknowledged that this may be arbitrary, but he just wanted to give a starting point um, um, of a, of a definition of prolonged solitary confinement where it actually goes into uh, torturous or uh, torturous conditions or ill treatment. Um, well, and then maybe I will close here because I'm, I'm aware of the time. Um, um, a part of those two uh, very strong prohibitions, indefinite pro um, solitary confinement, where the, the person does not know how long he will stay actually in isolation, and the uh, prolonged after 15 days, there are two more very important uh, absolute prohibitions contained in the, in the new uh, rules, which uh, one is for mental or physical uh, disabilities, prisoners who suffer from disabilities, but then also the prohibition for women and children. Um, it's basically for women and children, um, it's, it was just incorporating uh, other UN standards like the Bangkok rules and, and um, the Havana rules, not the Beijing rules, yeah. um, as well as um, recommendations from the Committee for the Rights of the Child, etc. The reason behind is for children, for instance, is that the threshold to consider, well, they, they experience uh, pain and suffering much different from adults, and, uh, and the threshold to what, it, what um, is considered or uh, amounts to torture or ill treatment has to be much lower, and solid isolation definitely would compass the, the threshold, as, um, as um, al already we heard that um, um, many experts agree on. And then for women, the, um, the reason was, and we heard it's pregnant women, breastfeeding women, women with infants, and it comes from the Bangkok rules, is that there is um, a stronger, even stronger impact on mental well-being of women due to, to the strong need um, um, for close contact with their children, basically. Um, <clears throat> so there is absolute prohibition for, um, for those um, groups, let's say vulnerable groups. Um, and so to close, after all those restrictions and prohibitions, the Nelson Mandela rules so still uh, allow for solitary confinement in the context of disciplinary measures. So in, in contrast to what we heard from the previous speaker, but only in exceptional cases, as a last resort, as short time as possible, and subject to independent review. Um, <coughs> I think I will leave it here. Um, I will maybe then go back to the additional safeguards um, that I have prepared. I, also the role of medical staff, as I mentioned, um, is, is an important one. Um, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you.
sorry about the rush of this, but it's really a very rich discussion, but we would also like to allow some time for, for general discussion. We've very generously been given a couple of more minutes, so I'd like to open the floor for questions or comments. I'd like to ask you to keep them brief, um, and please introduce yourself and the organization that you're representing. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Cheryl Chalev, uh, at Oxford University. Um, I'll try not to kind of hog uh, too much time, but just a very brief comment uh, to Malcolm um, about the involvement of health professionals, as Stephanie alluded. This is uh, very problematic. We've got ethical issues, and we try to kind of get around it with the Mandela rules to say uh, that the doctor should visit uh, the person in solitary confinement uh, at their request uh, or if they deem necessary. Uh, and that was partially because prisoners told us that they actually get quite annoyed when the doctor comes there every day. And as I said, it does raise ethical issues um, for the prisoner. Um, about the issue of five people in a cell, I think what, one of the things that happened when solitary confinement became finally more and more a discussed issue, that almost every bad prison practice, uh, people try to kind of bring it under the, the, the umbrella of solitary confinement. Now, there are a lot of negative prison practices uh, that are not solitary confinement and uh, you know personally I think five people in a cell uh, by definition does not constitute solitary confinement but that's um, my opinion. Um, Jim, I don't know if Jim can hear us but um, I think that kind of I agree I think that we should not punish by solitary confinement it's not civilized but I have a problem with uh, saying that other forms are okay uh, because prison authorities are very very apt at finding different explanations. So, you know, I've heard numerous times people say, oh, no, no, that's not for punishment. You know, that there for many, many other reasons. Uh, the bottom line is it does punish the individual, whether or not that is the intention. Um, oh, sorry. sorry, everyone. Um, and just one last uh, comment with Stephanie with the, um, uh, S the, the, the Essex uh, group, uh, which was an interesting little anecdote. Uh, we tried to explain what does meaning for human contact mean because it's not a legal term, very difficult to explain. Um, I suggested utilitarian, so contact which is not utilitarian, uh, but I was told by European colleagues that when translated to different languages, it doesn't quite uh, translate well, uh, which is why we went with these other uh, explanations. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Sharon. Let's take two more comments or questions, and then we'll uh, give the floor back to the panelists. Um, thank you very much. I was, oh, sorry, Vicky Canning from the Open University. I would just um, ask if there are, considering the, Malcolm had touched on the, uh, the assimilation of responsibility to other prisoners, and I'm just wondering if there are practical or legal implications on the monitoring uh, or uh, regulating of solitary confinement considering the expansion of the private um, prison estate and the um, problems that are there problems what are the implications of the use of outsourcing to corporations and private companies in regulating the use and uh, pr uh, of solitary confinement Is there any final question before we give the floor back to the panelists? No. Okay, so thank you very much for these questions and comments. Uh, please, Malcolm and uh, Jim and Stephanie. I actually... <laughs> Are you still hearing me? Yes. Yep. I can give an answer to that last question. Uh, in the UK, private prison companies cannot impose disciplinary sanctions. The disciplinary sanctions are always imposed by a uh, representative of the prison system who is appointed full time to the prison to gather these things. So the private prison companies do not have the power to impose sanctions. Thank you, yeah. Thank you, yes. And, um, be, and um, as, as Jim says, that's the position um, in, in the UK. Um, beyond that, 
in, uh, and where these things may be occurring more, more generally, it ought not to be a problem per se, because of the same regimes of responsibility and control ought to be applicable. So there ought to be uh, no, no, no differentiation in terms of responsibility in that regard. Certainly the problem that I was alluding to is that some, somewhat removed from this, this is where de facto the operations inside places of detention are in reality being run, run by other detainees, um, often with the um, collusion of the prison authorities, of course, um, but that then sets up an entirely different and problematic um, dynamic with which to deal with. Uh, just very briefly on, on the other points that Sharon raised. Um, yeah, first of all, yeah, I quite agree, five in a cell isn't solitary confinement. The point was that this was in a cell two and a half metres square, um, which were designed for the purposes of solitary confinement and all the other regime activities around it were. It was merely an example of how all these things get blurred in practice and just become so difficult to deal with if one simply tries to, shall we say, pigeonhole what ought to be into the slots that simply aren't applicable. Um, and, and thank you for the point you make about health professionals. It's a really difficult one. Um, I will admit um, there was one earlier report um, which we try not to mention where I think it even seemed to imply that the health professional ought to be initially checking to make sure that the person was fit for disciplinary sanction, which we know is not correct. Um, but again, this is something where over time understandings evolve and it will be good to get a feel of what best practice around this actually is. You know, there's obviously an important balance to be struck here and one needs advice from professionals on how best it has to be struck so thank you um, well I, I just continue with this very last point on, on healthcare personnel so we do have a provision now saying healthcare personnel shall not have any role in the imposition of disciplinary sanctions but the same rule then says that they should visit on a daily basis and they, sh they should report to the prison director on adverse effects of disciplinary sanctions and in another uh, corner of the rules, we have um, a provision saying clinical decisions only by healthcare professionals should only be taken by health and, and should not be overruled by or ignored by non-medical staff in the prison setting. And then we have another rule saying that um, the physician shall report to the prison director whenever he or she considers that the prisoner's physical or mental health has been has been or will be injuriously affected by continued imprisonment or the environment. So. All those rules together really pose the question to what extent um, the responsibility should or should not be put on medical staff and, and who is ultimately uh, taking decisions. Thank you, okay. thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank you all participants and also the speakers for your presentations and insights. Uh, perhaps briefly to answer the three questions or try to answer the three questions which we were supposed to debate. What does the international legal framework say? Well, quite clearly, the international legal framework is narrowing down the possibilities of legitimately and lawfully using solitary confinement as a punishment, prohibiting it. This is one milestone. We haven't yet reached the result. I think SPT and CPT also shows how, in their practice, they're moving towards what is the Mandela rules. But we also heard um, from uh, our colleague Jim McManus that actually that time has come to abolish it altogether. So perhaps the treaty bodies are quite progressive and innovative and even more than the rules which took six years to amend. Um, so maybe on that note we can conclude today uh, this session, this first panel, and invite you to have a break now for, uh, until 11 o'clock. Thank you very much. Well, sorry, just a round of applause for panel one, should we?